Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Well, we're only a few here, but y'all can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. That's a little bit better. I see Tony Andrews hiding behind the pole over there, and Brother Punter up there in the balcony and all that, you know. So y'all gather, those of you who can, within the sound of my voice, this is the forum on justice for Trayvon Martin. Where do we go from here? The voice that you just heard is of this brother whose name is Philip Agnew. He says he's ready. He's being touted as potentially another Martin Luther King. He is a brilliant, brilliant brother, warrior, uh, who is a part of the Dream Defenders, who courageously took over the office of Governor Rick Scott in Florida because they're ready. The issue becomes, is or are the students at York College ready? And that's what we're here to talk about this afternoon. My name is Ron Daniels, Dr. Ron Daniels, distinguished lecturer in the Department of Behavioral Sciences here at York College. And a part of my portfolio is to assist to pull together discussions like this. And we will have a great discussion. And fortunately, it's also being videoed so it can be shared with classes and whatever. Uh, we are at a disadvantage because there's another major event going on where there's food and music and all those good things. And today, Perhaps freedom cannot compete with food. But that's a part of the problem, you know, and I'm not going to relent on that. You know, it's, it's hopefully people will come back and forth. We do expect a group of people to come from the uh, Educational Opportunity Center that will be joining us briefly because they always support uh, these forums. Uh, let me just first of all quickly say that uh, we want to acknowledge uh, many who came to help bring this together today. Uh, Assistant Provost Holga Hink is here, uh, Ms. Marcia Comrie, Dan Phelps and his, uh, his um, communications team did a great job, Curtis Thomas with the graphics, uh, Anthony Andrews who's here, Jonathan Quash with the Men's Center, uh, and of course Kwame with the uh, Performing Arts Center audio team who always do such a magnificent job of making sure we're properly mic'd, have the right kind of sound, so even if people are hiding somewhere, they can at least hear us. And we appreciate that uh, very much. I hope I did not leave uh, anyone out. Let me quickly, before introducing the panel, just make a couple of remarks. The Trayvon Martin tragedy or travesty or however you want to characterize it was one of the most traumatic events in the recent history of these United States of America trauma, not only in the black community, but the whole nation was riveted for months over the, the killing, murder, however you want to characterize it, of this young, uh, unarmed person, slaughtered really almost like a lamb uh, before a wolf, if you will. It exposed, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, even though we have an African-American president in the White House, it exposed the ugly face of certain aspects of ongoing racism in American society. It exposed stereotyping, the stereotyping of young black men, brown men, but I have to say almost disproportionately black men, of racial profiling. The reaction around the country was also phenomenal in that it really exposed the fear of the dangerous black man the image of the dangerous black man that has been projected and produced in the United States of America. In the wake of the acquittal, therefore, which shocked many people, there were many people who just really believed that there would be some kind of verdict that would be satisfying to the family that you just saw, but all of us, because collectively this was about Trayvon Martin, but Trayvon became the metaphor for many of the eels and ales of American society as it relates to the question of race. So many of us were equally stunned and agitated and angry for a moment. The question is, where do we go from here? Is there still a possibility of achieving out of this tragedy justice? Or will we just simply have been angry and frustrated for a moment and then retreat to the normalcy of business as usual or stop and frisk as usual or you know, stand your ground as usual until the next case comes up and then we'll get emotional again. Or will we in some way here at your college contribute 
or can we contribute indeed to struggling to find some form of solution? So that is the nature of our conversation today. I'm really delighted that we have both faculty and, and students, but also I want to particularly thank uh, three panelists who've come here today, who've taken out of their very, very busy schedules, and they are busy people who are on the front lines of the struggle, they have taken time to come today to share with you. And when that happens, frankly, it's, uh, it's, good. We'll be, you know, it's good to have a good response from our campus. So we're, we're delighted that they've come. And we're also delighted that the students from the Equal Opportunity Center have now arrived. They, they are always so good. Let's give them a big round of applause. They're always so uh, beautiful. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, to my left Dr. Divine Pryor. Dr. Divine Pryor, who will also be here uh, a week from tomorrow, actually, for the men's conference, which Jonathan Quash puts together along with others uh, with the, uh, the uh, the male initiative and, and the uh, CUNY system. Uh, I'm not going to go through long introductions. Dr. Devine Pryor is somebody I know personally. He is one of the most dynamic leaders we have in the country today. But he is distinguished because he is a formerly incarcerated person. He's like Malcolm. He went to jail. But he's now a PhD. That's right, a PhD, a Dr. Devine Pryor and he heads the only think tank for form, headed by formerly incarcerated person. In other words, everybody in the leadership of the center he heads is somebody who was in the joint at one point, but who got out, got their PhDs or their degrees, and they're now struggling to deal with the issues of, of uh, mass incarceration, the criminal punishment system, and whatever. So Dr. Devine Pryor is from the executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions is one of our panelists. You can give him a round of applause. Next, we have Darius Charney. And I have a particular pride in introducing him because before I was here, I was at another place. And that place was the Center for Constitutional Rights, which is, without question, one of the leading, well, I'm going to go beyond that. I'll be Bogodosh. It is the leading human rights organization in the world today. And Darius, all of you know about Stop and Frisk. All of you know how bad it's been in New York, right? Well, there was an organization who bought a lawsuit against the city of New York to say it has to stop. And they won that lawsuit. So that now the, the city, that's right, New York City is now in check, and he'll talk about that, and they're now under the supervision of a monitor where the person who led the assault this is a young person, too. That's what I always tell our students. Young. He's, not a, he's a young brother, right? He is the lead attorney on this case, Center for Constitutional Rights, Center Attorney Darius Charney. Um, in the middle, properly framed by two handsome and very strong men of color, is a person I knew from this, my days at the Center for Constitutional Rights. I think she was at the... Um, NACP Legal Defense and Education when I first met her. She is now, I mean, an incredible author. Bumped into at the Congressional Black Caucus weekend just a couple of days ago. Uh, but she's also a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And I think among the handouts, you have one of her articles. We took, we, we took the liberty of, we, we figured you wouldn't mind if we distributed some of your good stuff. Would you please uh, welcome attorney Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. And then joining us here from our home is a young man who went with us last year to Selma, Alabama. And we're going to be going to Selma, Alabama again for the Bridge Crossing Jubilee. He was among the nine York College students who went with us. I also had him in an internship program. He's, a part of, he's been a part of the, the uh, Men's Center. Uh, he is now uh, the acting vice president of the New York College, York College, I'm sorry, National Society for Leadership and Success. One of our own students, Xavier Crandall. Give it up for Xavier. And then representing the men's center today on the program is Ronald Sutar. Uh, he is, um, again, representing York's outstanding men's center. And of course, they'll, again, we've referenced the fact that there will be a program coming up next week from that. So would you give it up for Ronald Sutar? 
Last but not least, from our faculty here, someone who needs no introduction, he, he does lots of good stuff. I'm surprised he didn't come and lay out the music for us because he usually like makes sure it's framed properly. Uh, it's interesting, I bumped into President Keyes the other day. I had on my jeans and a hat and she, she almost didn't recognize me. She said, where's your suit and tie? I said, well, I don't usually come with a suit and tie, President Keyes. I just sort of hang out. But this brother is always dapper. He's always clean as a board of health. And that's not, the, that's not disparaging him. But he also is an incredible talent, has a new book out, which I'm for, he'll, sure he'll talk about in terms of Malcolm X and various other things. Acting director of the, of the um, African American Resource Center as well. Uh, he is a bad brother, our own Professor Michael Namphy. Let's give it up for him. Now this is how this is gonna proceed, and you should get ready for your input and for your questions as well. The, th the topic is justice for Trayvon Martin, where do we go from here? And what our panel is gonna do is have some discussion, and then we're gonna invite you to ask your questions and or to offer comments. The operative term is where do we go from here? Do you have ideas about where you go from here? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up with our panel, We'll then have Q&A from the audience, and then I'll have a few words uh, at the end. And since some people didn't get a chance to see this incredible video that was assembled by Dan Phelps and his staff, we'll probably show that at the end so everybody get a chance to see that because our Equal Opportunity Center students did miss the uh, video prelude. I'm going to start with Professor Attorney, I mean, Attorney Gloria Brown Marshall because one of the things we want to know are two or three things. One, if you'd be so kind as to talk to us about the case. Number one, your assessment of the case and the verdict. A lot of us were shocked by what happened. Um, some people said the case was not sufficiently prosecuted. Others say that it was, and it was really reasonable doubt given the statute. So number one, we'd like for you to speak to that. Secondly, would you be so kind as to talk to us about and we have a handout, by the way, that hopefully people can look at. We want you to know, what are these stand your ground laws? Even though it was not an integral part of the case, it was a part of the closing argument, we want you to know about these stand your ground laws. What are they? How do, that, how do they differ from the traditional uh, you know, self-defense and the rationale and, and how widespread are? So I know that's a big agenda, but you have a few minutes to succinctly talk about that. So, Gloria Brown Marshall's up first. Okay. Is this on? Is the mic on? Hello? Is it on? Okay. How much time do I have? Well, it, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll tap you, but it's, you know, it's, it's tight. You, you have to be succinct, you know. Okay. It's I like your closing argument. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I didn't grow up Baptist, so I'm not going to let this be too long. Can everybody hear her? Okay. Can you hear now, me? Now, the volume needs to be up on her mic a little bit, please. It needs. Pull it, it is. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in love with it. I'm, all right, I'm, all right, I'm okay. in it. I'm right. on it. I got it. Okay. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, fine, good. I really enjoy speaking with young people. I think it's so important because you hear all the time, you're our future and all that. I have a vested interest. When I get old, I need you to take care of me. That, that's, that, that's, it's that simple. When we get older, you're going to be here. And we want to feel secure that you know what you're doing. <laughs> Is that, that agreed upon? You understand that? Great, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay, so we have to invest in you the knowledge we have to a certain degree so that you know what you're doing when you are now at this table talking to other young people. That's the way it works, generationally. So the issue that the generations before me encountered involved Emmett Till. They involved voting rights, very hardcore voting rights. You cannot vote. They're now more intricate. By the time you get to be at this table, you'll have your own version of stop and frisk or stand your ground or whatever that might be. You're going to have to lean on what we've told you in order for you to come up with the litigation as Darius has and the programs as, as Dr. Pryor have, has done so that you'll have tools to fight the people who would oppress you and keep you from progressing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? 
So as you listen to us, I want you to kind of put it stored in the back of your mind that you will need this later when you are in positions of leadership. So it's not just listening, it's storing, it's recognizing and figuring out how you're going to use this for the future. I thank Dr. Daniel so much for bringing us together for this Trayvon Martin case. Many people think Trayvon is over, there's nothing we can do about it, and so much of this is based on the reaction. We react to things as opposed to being proactive and planning for things. Since we have had people who have placed obstacles in the path of our progress for 400 years, it should not be a surprise that something like this happens. The idea needs to be what are the tools that can be used when this happens, and has, as Dr. Daniels pointed out, where do we go from here? So with that, I want to just lay the groundwork, which is, who was Trayvon Martin? Many of you know, but then some people may not. Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old black teenager in Sanford, Florida, who was with his father and his father's girlfriend in a small town. It's called Sanford, and within that town, this community. And within that community, he decided one evening, around 7 o'clock, to go out to the 7-Eleven and get an iced tea and Skittles. On his way back, he encountered a volunteer person on a little town watch who was, as a volunteer, lived in the community, and he drove around looking to see if there were any suspicious characters. He sees Trayvon Martin. He decides Trayvon Martin is a suspicious character. He calls 911. 911 tells him not to encounter anyone, not to approach this person. Get back in your car. We are on the way. He decides, and this is where the dispute comes in the facts. Either he went back to his car and Trayvon Martin followed him, which is what George Zimmerman said at the time, a grown man of, of mixed, some people say Latino descent, others say he claims white, who decides that there is going to be this encounter. Trayvon Martin's parents and his attorney uh, representing the, the, um, the Trayvon Martin victim here of the shooting says that George Zimmerman attacked Trayvon Martin. Either way, an altercation ensues. Trayvon Martin is shot by George Zimmerman. From here we have, and this is February 26, 2012. From here we have nothing done for weeks at a time. Why? Because Florida has a law called stand your ground, which means there is no reason to retreat. You can meet what is considered force with force. Prior to this, a person had to walk away from a fight. You were young people. You were told to walk away. Remember that? You were told, you were raised with this idea that if you are encountering a fight, just walk away. So stand your ground is a law based on different states, legislatures can enact these laws that say, no, you no longer have to walk away. You could actually meet force with force. Florida has such a law. That's the stand your ground law. So when George Zimmerman called the police and said, I shot and killed someone, they took him downtown. There are pictures of that that, that emerged later, a video, they said, George Zimmerman claims stand your ground, therefore we're not arresting him, we're taking his statement and he can go home. Trayvon Martin's body lay in the morgue for days. Finally, after that weekend, the father claimed the body, identifying it as his son. And at that point, the family, Sabrina Fulton, his mother, and his father, then have to use social media to get enough attention around the shooting to have political pressure put on the police department weeks later to actually bring charges against George Zimmerman. Second degree murder charges are eventually brought against George Zimmerman. A special prosecutor, Angela Corey, is brought in. And at this point in time, the issue becomes, does stand your ground then alleviate any additional liability on the part of George Zimmerman to actually have to go to trial and prove that he was in fear of his life. Long story short, a year of protests take place. Many of you young people probably participated in those protests in your school and other places. Protests took place in New York City and in Union Square in Manhattan and around the country. When we reached the verdict in July, it's a verdict for a trial that we've watched, the country watched, the world watched. 
We saw prosecutors who we believe could have done a better job. We saw defense counsel who did a great job showing that this 17-year-old had perhaps used marijuana before, maybe even that night. They showed images of him and made him into this very scary guy to the point where the jury of six women from a very conservative Republican area acquitted George Zimmerman of all charges in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And it was from there we asked the question, where do we go from here when a grown man can say he feared for his life in the dark in a struggle with a 17-year-old when he had been told by police to get back in his car? And there was no evidence, of course, that major I issue here, a major element of any weapon Trayvon Martin had. He had no gun, no knife. He had only his hands. And from the hands of a 17-year-old, a grown man can shoot in cold blood and be acquitted for that crime. So then the question what all of us had on our minds, we could be next. What do we do now? Right. We are all Trayvon Martin. And therefore, we all have a vested interest in going forward and trying to maintain not just the safety of our black and brown teenagers, but some type of criminal justice system that allows us to trust that we can get justice. OK, thank you very much. Let's give it up for Gloria Brown Marshall. I uh, was scanning the audience. I think I saw a friend of mine come in that I want to invite to come and uh, be with us as well. I thought I saw Mark Thompson. Is Mark in the house? I just saw him. Uh, Mark, Thompson. Mark, come on up here and join us, man. Mark Thompson is the host of Make It Plain, Serious uh, Progress Left. And whenever you see national marches going down, Mark Thompson is usually there. So I want him to join us and give us a perspective because he's talking to listeners all across the country. He was in the thick of this. And uh, I'm glad he was willing to come out and, and join us. Um, so, we, so you were great because we really have about, you know, I gave you a little chart. So we got about five minutes each to sort of get ours in because we want to get to. You well, you did, no, you did, you, you, but you did. You, you, were, you, you, you were wonderful. You set the framework nicely. Now we want to turn to Darius um, Charney. Darius, let me just say this. And you have a handout. One of the things you should be clear about is the difference between the traditional the self-defense laws, which say you can defend yourself, but your first obligation is to retreat versus the stand your ground law, which says that you don't have to retreat first as long as, and here's the key term, as you feel, you hear that? Feel threatened. Feel like you're threatened. You can therefore use maximum force to defend yourself. Very, 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 Vague. And you have a handout that shows you where all these different laws have been passed. Darius, talk to us about, because even though this was not narrowly racial profiling, you know, narrowly defined, we think it was about this whole issue. So you talk to us about the New York case briefly, stop and frisk, where it is now, and your sense of how this plays out nationwide in terms of this phenomenon. Because it's not just Florida, it's about this whole issue of stop and frisk and the the violation of the rights of so many black and brown young men across this country. Darius, please. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank, you, thank you for having me as well. I'm very honored to be here. And uh, Ron, Ron didn't tell you that uh, he, he, he's been involved in this stop and frisk stuff for forever. And uh, if it wasn't for him, there never would have been the case that we brought. And I don't think we ever would have achieved the result that we got. So I really want to thank him for that as well. Um, as, as Ron pointed out, and I'll just start with this, I think the Trayvon Martin tragedy um, is really a part of the same, I'll call it beast, that Stop and Frisk here in New York is a part of, um, and that is a beast of racial profiling. It's a beast that involves the criminalization of young black and Latino men primarily, but also just young black and Latino people around the country, um, and it is something that has been with us really forever. Um, as since this, con this country was founded, as we know, on you know, white supremacy, and so this, this phenomenon has really been with us since the existence of this country. But what I wanna talk about um, today is, before I launch into the, the stop and frisk case and where it is now, is to just talk about um, 
what the case was really focused on and why I think it's going to be so important for not only New York, but really for the country. When we talk about racial profiling, what we are talking about is, um, as I mentioned at, at the outset, a criminalization of a group of people. And this is something that I think you saw with respect to George Zimmerman. I think it's something that we see and many of you have probably experienced in your daily lives in interacting with police here in New York City. And it is something that goes on around the country um, with respect to how young people of color are perceived by the larger society. Um, a lot of the, the stop and frisk statistics, I'm just going to give you a, a brief summary you may already know. But I think it's really important to understand not only how long this problem has been with us, but just how widespread it is here in New York. Um, during the, I guess we're in the 12 years now of the current uh, administration of Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Commissioner Ray Kelly, there have been almost 5 million uh, stops and frisks recorded by the New York Police Department in that period of time, 5 million. And that's just recorded. Um, that's when they actually bother to write it down. So in reality, we're probably talking about a lot more than that. As you also probably know, almost 90% of those stops were of black and Latino New Yorkers. And this is in a city where those two groups together are about maybe 50% of the population. So you're talking about a huge disparity here. 90% of those stops do not result in any discovery of criminal activity. In other words, nine out of 10 times, the person who is stopped is found to have not done anything wrong and is released without any further action. I wanna talk about weapons for a second because the police department has for decades been saying that stop and frisk is important to them because it's the way that they find guns, they get them off the street, they stop violence from happening. In less than 0.1% of all the stops, all those five million, less than 0.1% of the time is a gun discovered in these stops. That's right. So for a program whose purpose, at least publicly, is to recover illegal weapons, 999 times out of 1,000, they don't find one. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of an overview of the, the kind of breadth of the problem. And, and in terms of the, the, the long-standing nature of it, how many of y'all remember uh, Amadou Diallo? Y'all are pretty young, but I'm sure many of you remember that. That was 1999, right? Um, and that was in the Bronx. Mr. Diallo was a young uh, immigrant from West Africa. He was a street vendor who was shot to death, shot 40, 41 times by New York City police officers in the vestibule of his apartment in the Bronx. Now, the unit that, that conducted that killing, um, and of course, as you probably also, many of you know, uh, the officers were tried and acquitted. They were found not guilty of, of any crime. But the unit that perpetrated that killing is called the Street Crimes Unit of the New York Police Department. It doesn't exist anymore, at least not in name. But that particular unit of the police department was found by the New York State Attorney General that same year to be the most aggressive practitioners of illegal stop and frisk in New York City. In other words, that particular unit was stopping more people than any other unit in the police department, and it was engaging in the most racially biased uh, version of stop and frisk of any unit in the police department. So what happened to Mr. Diallo, and I was talking about it's all part of the same beast, is really part of the same beast, because the same police officers who are going out and stopping people, particularly black and Latino people, for no legitimate reasons were the ones who gunned down Mr. Diallo. Now, that was 1999. There was a lawsuit brought, which Ron knows about, called coincidentally Daniels versus the city of New York, uh, which was challenging the stop and frisk practices of that particular unit. The case eventually settled in 2003. In other words, the, t the parties came to an agreement to end the case. Um, there was a settlement agreement, but that settlement agreement, I think, left a lot uh, a lot of things open, which as we came to learn in the next eight or nine years were pretty important. 
And the main thing it left open was that it did not in any way, shape, or form create a mechanism to oversee and make sure that what the police department was doing was legal and constitutional. In other words, it left the NYPD to, its, to police itself. And what we now know, uh, nine years, ten years later, is that the NYPD will not, cannot and will not police itself. It has to be made to change. Um, and, and this is something I think that is very important to understand and is going to now tie into what I want to talk about now, which is our case. We call, it's called Floyd versus the City of New York. The, Mr. Floyd is one of our plaintiffs. He was a um, college student at City College, actually, another CUNY campus, who was stopped and frisked himself outside of his own apartment in the Bronx in 2008 um, on two occasions. Uh, but as was mentioned, we did achieve a very, I think, important victory uh, this summer in August. Um, there was a 198-page decision. I have it here if anybody wants to read it, and it's good bedtime reading. But uh, in that case, in the decision, the federal judge in Manhattan, and this is a federal judge appointed by the President of the United States and, and charged with enforcing the constitutional rights of people of the United States of America, found that the New York Police Department had engaged for many years in a pattern and practice of race-based stop and frisk, which violates the equal protection rights of black and Latino New Yorkers. Now, for a federal judge to, I think, recognize and to rule that what many of the people in this room and in this, on this campus have known for years is, in fact, unconstitutional and a violation of people's fundamental rights is not a small thing. <laughs> And remember, this is in the same summer, which I like to call for, for, I think, those of us who do civil rights work, legal, racial justice work in the legal arena, the summer of you know, racial discontent because we had the Trayvon Martin verdict. We had the terrible decision in June by the United States Supreme Court striking down a portion of the Voting Rights Act in a case involving the same state where the march on Selma over the, the Edmund Pettus Bridge took place. In that same summer, we have this decision, which I think in some ways at least saved us somewhat, I think, from our, our summer of, of racial discontent. Because to have a federal judge rule against the largest police department in North America that you are engaging in racial profiling and that you have to stop doing so is, a, is a, I think, no small thing. But I think what's even more important, and this is the last thing I'll say, because I know I'm being watched, is that what is going to happen next? The judge in her decision, she actually had two decisions. She had the big 200-page one, and then she had a little 30-page one. In the 30-page one, what she did is she said, I'm going to set up a process, okay, because there are a lot of problems here. We need to fix them. But you know what? I'm not going to tell you how to fix it. But what I am going to make you do is I'm going to make you, police department, engage in a dialogue. And it's not just going to be, you know, sit down at a table. It's going to be an ongoing dialogue. It's going to be overseen by a facilitator and a monitor that I'm going to appoint. And I want you to go to those communities in New York City where stop and frisk is used most, where it's used in a discriminatory fashion. And you need to get input from the voices of the people in those communities as to why, how things need to change. And unless and until you do that, and unless and until you implement those changes, I am not going to let you out from under this federal supervision. So that's where we are today. So that is, I think, a big deal because the communities most impacted by this practice are now going to have a seat at the table. And this is something that is going to be happening over the next six to nine months. So I encourage all of you to visit our website from Center for Constitutional Rights. There's going to be a lot of information on there about how to get involved in this. It's called the Joint Remedial Process. Um, and I can give people the website address. It's www.ccrjustice.org. And if you just type in um, Floyd, which is the name of the case, in the case search, there's a little window. It'll bring you up to that, and you can get more information. But this is something that has not really been done in any other police department in the country that I know of. Maybe Cincinnati is the only one. 
So there's a lot of hope here, but it's going to be, a, this is where the real work starts. You know, lawyers, we know how to sue and, and identify problems, but now we've got to problem solve, and that's, I think, where the rubber really hits the road. So I'm going to stop there. Want to big applause for Darius Tarney. A victory. How many people in the audience have been stopped by the police? Just raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. I, I just wanted to do that because this shows how widespread it really is, and many have been stopped more than once. Now we want to turn to Dr. Divine Pryor. Uh, Divine wanted to talk to you because there are some people who think that the Trayvon case was an aberration. aberration. The Malcolm X Grassroots Movement put out a study that kind of showed otherwise. I'd like for you to comment on that as well as your sense of the significance of this case uh, in terms of the, uh, what needs to be done moving forward. So you have your five minutes. <laughs> yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be here sitting on a panel with such uh, distinguished lecturers, uh, people who are on the ground doing the work. I want to thank Ron Daniels for extending the invitation for me to come out today. I, I'm going to attempt to be as brief as possible. Uh, Ron was referring to a report that was put out by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement that was entitled Operation Ghetto Storm. And Operation Ghetto Storm was, uh, it was a follow-up to the two, 2012 annual report on what they call extrajudicial killing of black people. What does that mean? That means this is the killing of black people that doesn't happen when a person is sentenced to death. It happens on the street when a police officer becomes the judge, the jury, and the executioner. When a security guard decides that it's their right and their obligation to eliminate what they consider to be a threat to society. And so what this report actually documented in detail is that every 28 hours, a black person is being killed in America. You looked at the data from the Department of Justice over the year 2012, and this is what they concluded every 28 hours. Now, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about the report because if, if you want to hear what I have to say uh, about this and other things, just go on YouTube and on the internet. I got plenty of stuff there. I want to spend my five minutes today talking to you about this whole phenomenon of walking while black, or talking while black, and certainly running while black, being against the law. And you need to understand where that comes from. You gotta understand that being black in America has been, according to the structures that be, a curse. If you think that's not true, just think about it, right? When the, when the bad guy comes, he wears black and the good guy wears white, right? Devil food cake is black, but angel food cake is white. It's all right to tell a little white lie, but don't you tell a black lie, right? When the stock market fell, it was Black Monday, right? And so we know this whole assault on blackness is real. And it goes all the way back to the founding of America when the legal structure was first put in place and was based on two, two uh, factors. It was property and property rights. The property rights were bestowed on the property owner who were unfortunately uh, white slave owners and the property were black people. And of course, the property did not have the right to sue, couldn't walk to or fro without a pass. You couldn't even get married. That's why we had to jump the broom. So there has been an assault on blackness even going back to the founding of America. And we fast forward. And that assault comes in various wars. You know, they had the war on crime, and they had the war on drugs, and then they had the counterintelligence program. Now they got the war on terrorism. When they pass that, there'll be another war, and it'll be targeted against people of color and black people in particular. I mean, we claim to be the most democratic nation in the world, yet we have more incarcerated people than any other nation in the world. 2.5 million people in prison, and the large majority of those people happen to be the descendants of former slaves could be a coincidence. I don't know if, if you're aware, and I've been trying to research, because I wanted to find the date when capitalism and racism engaged in holy matrimony. In other words, the date when racism married capitalism. And out of that, they birthed a child. And that child is called 
the prison industrial complex. And so the fact that the descendants of slaves are the ones that make up the large majority of the prison industrial complex should not come as a surprise. And in fact, if you really want to look at um, the situation that much closer, uh, you could recognize a few things. This really blew my mind. You know, I was, I was studying American history, which I do, and I, you know, I, I was ran into this uh, Emancipation Proclamation. This is the, the document which, you know, freed us allegedly. But what I realized when you look at it in context, that directly after that document was uh, produced, there was a new set of laws that were put on the books. Those uh, books uh, were called the, the Black Codes. And those, those codes were put in place because Southern plantation owners were concerned about the fact that if you freed the slaves, that the Southern economy would collapse. So in order to try to preserve and maintain the economy, they had to make sure that they could keep slavery intact while at the same time appearing to free the slaves. Well, how do you do that? You create a set of laws. And the first law that was created was called the vagrancy law. And a vagrant was any person who was not employed and did not have a place of residence. So the, the, as soon as a slave stepped off the plantation, they were breaking the law because they didn't have a place of residence and they were unemployed. And then they came with the convict lease law. That was an interesting law because that was a law that said that anybody who was convicted and incarcerated could be leased back to the plantation, sometimes before your bed got cold. And then they came with the literacy law. This is a very interesting one. The literacy law said that you're free now, you can vote. But before you could vote, you had to first pass a literacy test. Of course, if you passed the test, you were arrested. Because the only way you could pass the test is if you knew how to read. It was against the law for a slave to read. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that we have a system that has, has waged war against blackness. And that so you, you have to be careful that you don't walk too fast and certainly don't wear black and certainly don't run down the block while you're black because if you do so, you can be arrested. I'm going to close with a story that's going to take 10 seconds, Ron. And this is a story of the impact of mass incarceration. Police officers in our schools, children having to go through metal detectors, watching all these shows on TV that depict uh, a, a black man as animals and as brutal and, and deserving of incarceration. And that's the impact that it has on the children who are young and impressionable and what it's doing to them. And I remember 15 years ago when we were working with young people and we found out that a lot of them had fathers in prisons, we began to promote education and tell them that's why you got to go to school so you can help mommy and daddy, so you can be anything you want. You can be surgeons and engineers. And we began to pump them up. And then we broke them up into groups and said, we want you to go and draw where you see yourself in the future. And one group of third graders, Black kids in Bed-Stuy came back with a drawing of a classroom with a tunnel with little stick figures walking through the tunnel into the prison. And so we immediately terminated the exercise because it was obvious that we didn't explain to them accurately what we were talking about. And the little third grade black kid grabbed my jacket and he looked at me and said, Mr. We understood what you said. And I said, well, I don't understand. Out of all the things that you could have drawn and all the things we told you you could become, why would you draw that? And a little kid looked at me with a puzzled look on his face. He looked at the kid on his left and the kid on his right, and he shrugged his shoulders. He said, because that's where we go, mister. Everybody knows that. Thank you. Now, before you finish, because there was a certain specificity to my request on the Malcolm X study, how many unarmed black men have been killed by either security guards or police officers since Trayvon Martin uh, was killed? Uh, 313 since Trayvon Martin. 313 have been killed since Trayvon Martin. That's, that's the figure I wanted to get out. I wanted to get that so that you understand that this is not some isolated phenomenon. It's not just Florida, it's across the country. It's here in New York City, it's everywhere, and that study is available. Now we want to turn to Professor Namphy and. Professor, I know that it looks like you and Divine might cover some of the same territory in some of the ways, but, but we want to also for you to help contextualize for us uh, the reality of this phenomenon of stop and frisk the dangerous black man and this criminalization of black people. Please give it up for Professor Nampi. Thank you, Ron. Is mic working? Everybody good? It's a good panel. I'm glad to be a part of it part of this important discussion, and I'm pleased that you all would take the time to come out 
and address a serious issue that we hope is part of your education as well as your ability to handle yourself out on the street and in the world of guns and bombs. Brother Daniels mentioned that can, can whenever people, Can people hear? I'm, I'm always concerned. Uh, can you hear him? Okay, I just want to be sure. Make absolutely sure everybody can hear me. Is everybody good? I'm just warming up. Whenever I'm speaking anywhere, Brother Daniels mentioned it, I try to listen to some good music that's relevant to the subject matter. So I put on a little Marvin Gaye this morning. I found that when it comes to questions of poverty, war, police brutality, and other racial violence, really all aspects of white supremacy and its devastating results, Marvin Gaye always helps us get to a good place where we can come up with some answers. And I'm thinking about Trayvon and his family, and now I, I can't get the words out of my head. Picket lines and picket signs. Don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me so you can see what's going on. Marvin said that 42 years ago, and it's still a good word today. If white people talked to and listened to people of color more, Trayvon and so many others might still be alive. But they are dead. Mother, mother, there's far too many of us dying, Marvin said. And we're here today try to pick up the pieces. I very much appreciate uh, everything that our colleagues here on the panel have said. We are in a university here, so uh, this, this won't be too academic, but I'll take just three minutes to give us a little um, sociological and historical context of how terror is used in the United States, either state-sponsored or otherwise. But a good starting place, my father always taught me that you have to have a good starting place to understand something thoroughly. Very simply, a good starting place to understand Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman is that what happened to Trayvon Martin is a manifestation of white supremacy. What happened to Trayvon Martin is a manifestation of white supremacy. And that's nothing new. You just heard Brother Divine take us back through some of this history. I won't repeat the things he said. But it's nothing new and it's nothing different. I don't know the answer to this, but I'd be surprised if anyone on this panel actually thought that George Zimmerman would be found guilty of the crime he was charged with and committed. I'm just kind of curious. For all of you here, how many of you here predicted a not guilty verdict? For, that he would not be found guilty of this crime in this case. That's most of the people here. That's not surprising. I know I did, with good reason. The basic essence of white supremacy in America legally was demonstrated in 1857 by Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Taney in the case Dred Scott versus Sanford, when he said quite clearly and bluntly that a black person, quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, unquote. White people, by definition in the United States, anthropologically, sociologically, to be white in the United States requires that you are superior to black people. And if you are superior to black people, you therefore have the right to police black people. All white people in the United States have a right to police black people. It's nothing new. It goes way back. The very identity of a white person, the very identity structure that says you are a white person, part of that identity structure is that you can police a black person. So even little white boys felt that they had a right to ask you who you are what you were doing, call you boy, 
Call you by your first name, that sort of thing. So that's a good starting place to understand what's happened to Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, pure and simple. The list of concrete examples, of course, is long. It was easy to understand how all this worked on the plantation and why it worked. Enslaved Africans were subject to random and not so random violence and terror by definition. But this, of course, didn't end when the Civil War ended. It almost did for a few years there, right after the Civil War. But after the Reconstruction, with the exit of the Black Union troops that were policing the Southern states, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the elimination of African American legislatures and state houses and the national federal government, a century-long reign of terror was reimposed on black Americans. And I would argue that George Zimmerman is just an extension of that sort of rule by terror. You can draw a historical arc of your own, and I encourage you to do this for yourself. We're all familiar with the names Homer Plessy, the Scottsboro Boys, Emmett Till, Medgar, Malcolm, Martin, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, Eleanor Bumpers, Rodney King, Abner Louima, Amadou Diallo, and as James Baldwin says, so many more. I love when he said, they're killing my friends. What do you expect me to do about it? The ability to kill us and hurt us ran and randomly police us with impunity, whether by a cop or a soldier or a citizen, is central to the maintenance of white supremacy, to the right to rule because you are white. I'm with Marvin Gaye. We've got to find a way to bring some love in here today and I suppose that's what the good folks here on this panel are trying to do, to try to solve this violent mess and let us know where we are in that process. I'm done, thanks. All right, right on cue, all right. It was some Marvin Gaye, no less. Now we want to quickly turn to our two distinguished students on our panel. We've asked them to give their reflections as young people uh, who or more likely than perhaps others to experience uh, what Trayvon experienced, even though President Obama said that Trayvon, he could have been Trayvon himself. Attorney General Holder talked about having to sit his son down to warn him about the police. So we'd like to first turn to Xavier Crandall for your contribution, uh, followed by Ronald Sutar, and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience. So Xavier, it's all yours. This thing on? Yes. I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. We are here to have a discussion. And yes, I was invited here to partake in this panel by Dr. Ron Daniels, Mr. Anthony Andrews, and Director Jonathan Quash. And the three of them will tell you that I have a very contrarian view on society. In my classes, I am known as that guy the guy when everybody's in unison, and the professor would say, Xavier, what do you think about this? And everybody would look at me, and they would expect a fight. So, in regards to when I took this panel, given my views, everybody thought that I would defend George Zimmerman, that I was on his side. And I think that's part of the problem. I don't have a side. I don't believe that anybody should have a side. I have looked into this issue since the case first broke in February of last year. And in regards to the issue of whether or not stand your ground should be repealed, case in point, my answer is no. I don't think it should. And I would just like to give a few examples of why I think that is the case. If you would look at your graphs of the colored American chart, you would see that Stand your ground is essentially an extension of the Castle Doctrine. And there are three key aspects to the Castle Doctrine which need to be known. Number one is that the incident needs to be occurred in your home. Number two, the person under attack must, well, 
Number two, the person under attack may not be committing a crime. And number three, the person has to reasonably believe that they have to reply with necessary force. And in regards to this case, it seems like that issue would have applied to Trayvon Martin more so than George Zimmerman. The reason why George Zimmerman did not use stand your ground in this case is because he couldn't. We all know that he obeyed the orders of the dispatcher when he pursued Trayvon Martin. We already know that, give me one second. Yes, we know that George Zimmerman was not under attack when he delivered the 911 call. We know that he ignored the dispatcher's orders when he pursued Trayvon Martin, so he could have been seen as the instigator. And if Trayvon Martin would have survived, he could have used stand your ground. And he would have been found, would have been tried for voluntary assault had he survived because he did not defuse the situation and we were going back to the whole issue of the right to self-defense. So I have many arguments as to why I feel this way. I won't take as much time, but I hope to present my findings in our school newspaper, Pandora's Box, so hopefully the Amsterdam News, one of those two. So I feel that my views need to be heard and I look forward to articulating my thoughts in any medium that I find available. So thank you. All right, and uh, Brother Ronald, you got a name like mine, so I know you're gonna represent strong. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, folks. I almost don't know where to start with this, um, but I wanna ask a question. How many of you hate white people? Just raise your hand if you hate white people. I can say I did. No, don't be afraid. If you hate white people, raise your hand. Okay, there was a point in time where I did, all right? And um, I wanna just start off here. See, I used to hate white people until I realized that, and I really, really had to realize that there are real factions within our government, white factions that hate me as well. And I guess once I came to that realization, I was like, all right, cool, so they hate me, I hate them, but they got the guns in the jail cells. And I don't even have a full college degree yet, so how am I gonna fight back and what am I gonna do? And um, so my conclusion was, all right, it's cool, let's, let's stop hating. Like, well, let me stop hating them because my hate is going to get me nowhere. Instead, let me take my hate for them and direct it into love toward myself and toward my fellow black brothers. Um, you know, I'm a busy man. I got a job, full-time job doing school, so it's not really easy to enact that love in ways that, you know, can really touch many lives. But I've made a personal decision. Every year that passes, I'm gonna change the life of one of my black brothers for the positive. I got a young, name, a young brother named Iggy from my hood. He likes to box, got into a fight at the corner store, knocked the kid out, went to jail. I waited for Iggy to come home. I asked his mom, when's he coming home? She said, oh, he'll be home tomorrow night. We're gonna go pick him up from jail. I said, okay, this happened about six months ago. When Iggy came out of jail, I took him to the Queens EOC. We spoke with Miss Ali sitting right there. And I made sure my boy Iggy signed up to get his GED. Now Iggy has a GED and he's starting college. I took that, that hate, I took that hate that I had for white people and decided to put it into a, a medium that would cause and enact change because at the end of the day, see, stand your ground is not the central issue. Like stand your ground has uh, the, an effect on our community but it is not the central issue. The central issue is the perceived value of the black life in our society. Our value is what's important. Like, and, and it starts with us. Like, we have to value our life. We have to fight for our life if we are going to expect white people to even respect that value. And so, um, I believe that, you know, approaching and confronting uh, the stand your ground laws and bringing them up, this is just the means to one, make sure that prejudice in the form of a bullet does not have a winning streak in our communities, but also to maybe preserve our lives up until the fact that we come up with a means of increasing our perceived value in society. Um, and I believe that there are many ways to go about doing that. Um, I don't know if this is the form right now to express those or to talk about them or will it be done later? 
All right. Um, so I believe one place to start is with self-love and mentorship. Um, that's something that Mr. Jonathan Quash has made extremely clear to me and, and has kind of built a passion within me for. Um, I believe that we need mentors. Um, I spent 25 years of my life without a mentor, just trying to figure it out on my own, being angry, being upset, being confused. And I believe that we have to begin to really, really step into our young black men's lives at an earlier age and to kind of gain them the give them the guidance and allow them the wisdom that will allow them to, as you said, Brother Divine, walk while black, run while black, talk while black, because it's not what you do, but it's how you do it. Um, personally, I believe that, um, that language is important in building our values. Um, the average American from certain studies that I've done can only speak English. And then you meet a Creole brother or a brother from Haiti and he you know, has his you know, Patois accent, and we like, oh, what's up with that? But that brother know two languages. You know what I'm saying? His value is now increased. You look at Spanish people that are coming, and they're speaking Spanish, and you, I've seen people say, hey, man, you in America now, speak English. But his value is actually a little bit higher than yours, because that brother knows two languages, and you only know one. Now, imagine if, and this is just a scenario, but Trayvon's walking down the street, and George Zimmerman approaches him, and Trayvon turns around and starts speaking to this man in Mandarin, or in Spanish, which is Zimmerman's language. Now Trayvon has opened up a means of his increased perceived value, because now Zimmerman's looking at this young man as a, whoa, this young black man is speaking Mandarin? Well, well how, how did he learn Mandarin? I don't even know Mandarin. And now he thinks twice before he pulls that trigger, because he wonders, well, who was his father? What school did he graduate from? Where did he get his degree from? So that's just like, you know, a, a quick example of, of one of the, um, the, the means that I use, the means that I believe can be used as far as, you know, increasing our intelligence level. I believe, I mean, one of my goals eventually is to open up language centers within black and, and urban communities that teach us different languages, that, that have us speak in three and four languages. And if you look, up until 150 years ago, the average person knew two to three languages. And I'm talking about impoverished people. I'm not even talking about people who are distinguished. I'm talking about just a regular average Joe. And um, Let, let's, uh, because we're going to have some Q&A after. So let's okay. stop it there, because we want to get an opportunity for our audience to get involved. If there are those who have a comment, who want to engage in any way, there's a microphone right here. You can do that. Uh, anybody who wants to ask the question, offer a perspective, uh, certainly there's been a range of views offered. Uh, 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 Xavier was somewhat quiet, but it seemed to be saying, he seemed to be saying that he doesn't believe the stand your ground law should be repealed. And he, he says he wants an opportunity to further defend that. Uh, our other student talked about, you know, how we can increase our value, you know, and, 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 and that. So I'm, want, I'm interested in now getting people, don't be shy, come to the microphone. And while you're doing that, Quickly, Mark, would you just um, give us a sense, as a radio talk show host nationwide, as people are lining up, the kinds of issues that you deal with, the kind of reaction you were dealing with as this case was unfolding. Again, this is Mark Thompson. He is the longtime um, moderator of Make It Plain uh, on Sirius XM, and I sometimes sit in for him. Uh, uh, he helped raise me and, and train <laughs> me and mentor me, so uh, you know, I thought he could come today and, and uh, show off a little bit. Go right ahead. Well, thank you. L let me just first of all thank Dr. Daniels for inviting me. He says I raised him. I, in fact, have known him all of my adult life, uh, beginning when he ran for president in 1992. And so often I have a lot of fun. And you all might want to try this uh, at home yourselves. When decisions are made and, and different policy and issues and crises are going on in the country, I always try to imagine what Dr. Daniels would do if he were president. Uh, and those of you who are his students and colleagues might enjoy doing the same. I would just also say that in terms of his history over the past 40 years in black political movements and black politics, uh, his history, uh, his role as a scholar activist, and his institutional memory uh, far exceeds anyone else and he has no peer. And so York College, you are very blessed to have Dr. Ron Daniels 
in your midst. And I would encourage all the students here uh, to sit at his feet and learn as much as possible about our history, our people, and our black political struggle. Let's give Dr. Ron Daniels another round of applause for putting this together. And um, very, very quickly, because I know we have people online, a report was just released last week. I'm going to give you a, a couple of websites to go to so you can research this yourself. Uh, it's Center for American Progress, AmericanProgress.org, where they studied the intersection between concealed carry laws and stand your ground laws. It's a very serious intersection there. And where you have more concealed carry laws in this country, in those states that have those laws, Texas A&M study found that the murder rate has actually gone up 8%, okay? Um, where you have stand your ground laws, the justification for homicides for white versus black, where a white individual shoots an African-American, 35% justification. But when it's an African-American versus a white, the justification is less than 3%. Um, you can see that report, License to Kill, License to Kill at AmericanProgress.org. Also, Professor Carl Bogus, and Dr. Daniels and I have talked about this individual at Roger Williams University. He's written a couple of important pieces and studies on the history of the Second Amendment itself. The Tea Party has uh, uh, changed history, revised history. Uh, the Second Amendment was not about a militia or an army for the sake of a militia or an army. The argument was made by Patrick Henry uh, to James Madison that we needed the Second Amendment, they needed the Second Amendment, I should say, that the colonists needed the Second Amendment for the purpose of keeping a militia for slave catching. The hidden history of the Second Amendment by Professor Carl T. Bogus, Google that. And finally, um, he also has a piece about Second Amendment arguments for the individual right. The Heller decision was the first time the Supreme Court, Antonin, no good Antonin Scalia wrote the opinion, was the first time the Supreme Court said that we had an individual right to bear arms. From 1887 to 1960, there was not, this is from the beginning of when law review articles were library and index run. From 1887 to 1960, not a single law review article in America was published upholding the individual right to bear arms. It was after 1960, and the NRA started paying uh, law professors to write articles favorable to the individual right. So I just think we have to keep all that in mind. Carl Bogus, look him up. AmericanProgress.org, License to Kill, and you can see some of these things for yourselves. Thank you very much. All right, then very good information. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sarah Diallo, and uh, I want to thank you, my brother, about what is about languages. Uh, I came to this country nine years ago, and when I came here, I was speaking only two languages, French and Pular, and now I speak English and Spanish. This is four languages. And um, thank you. Um, uh, last year I was homeless and I was sleeping on a train and uh, I followed the case of Floyd versus NYPD. I went to, to the trial one time and um, my boyfriend is Spanish and uh, he get um, stop and freaks all the time because of his ethnicity. Um, I, during the trial, they were talking about the police people making quarters by profiling people by their gender, their color, their religion. Are they going to stop doing that? Because seriously, I mean, this is 2013 and people need to wake up. Okay, thank you very much. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Aquanetta Benjamin. Um, I'm a student here. And I just had a comment for everybody. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody that's here and that came out to, to do this. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, but um, I find a problem with us as um, African Americans when we don't mobilize as soon as the problem begins. I think that's one of the main things that we need to start doing because I, if we're not valued, our money is valued. 
And I think we forget that. There's an active um, push to get African-American dollars now, because they know that we spend so much money that they're getting famous people, they're getting entertainers, everybody to endorse their products in, in, in order to reach our dollars. But we don't utilize that power, because that is power. When this all happened, nobody should, that didn't live in, uh, in Florida, that's African-American, should not have been going to Florida. Everything should have been canceled. We should have been investing time into seeing what products come out of Florida and saying we're not going to buy those products. We needed to put pressure on before. I'm not saying now. I'm saying, yes, that's good. But when it first started, we should have been doing that. The reason being because those corporations speak louder than we can. If they don't hear us, they hear those billion-dollar corporations that say, what's going on? We need our money. What's we need the on? money. We need those dollars back. Y'all better get something done. And as black people, we have to be uncomfortable sometimes to get what we need. We have to mobilize. We have to start investing our time and our knowledge. And we have to see things for what they are. And we have to say, we can't say, oh, it doesn't bother me. That could have been my child. Could have been your brother, your cousin. It could have been anybody. And we have to stick together. If we don't stick together and we don't um, understand that a little bit of uncomfortability for the good of all is what will help us get through this. All right, thank you very much. Let's give it up. No, it's not too late. I haven't made my remarks yet. You know, I just thought I'd just slip that in. That was a nice segue because it's not too late yet. This is, this is on, and you sort of stole my thunder a little bit. So, but we, this is on. This is not over yet. Yes, sir. Hi, how y'all doing? Um, I, uh, I thank you for being here. I like that we have a, a black woman here because it's always beautiful to get a, a different perspective, you know. I love my sisters. Um, and, and to that brother right there, like, I totally agree with you about perceived values and, and, and whatnot. And, but I think we've seen that we, we, we are commodities. Let, let, me, let me, can I ask the question about the perceived values question here? Because yeah. we're, and we can go back and forth on this. Because I thought there was a discussion, and maybe this was just, you know, fanciful or whatever, that if Trayvon Martin had approached Zimmerman and spoke to him in Spanish, there would have been a different outcome. Because it would have been valued differently. I agree. How, I, how many I, people I, believe that? I, that if I, he had spoken to Zimmerman in Spanish, Zimmerman would have acted differently? Absolutely. Um, excuse me. Can I interject? I'm, I'm half. Okay. We'll, this, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, I just wanted to no. put that out there. It's almost tantamount to like the, if the woman who got raped had behaved differently, if she had been dressed differently, she didn't have whatever that, I mean, you know, so I'm a little nervous about that oh. e equation because we don't want to get in a situation where we're saying that if we change our behavior, the onus becomes on then the victim to change their behavior as opposed to the perpetrator. So I just wanted to just put a pin in that. But go no, right I, no, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm half Puerto Rican and... Uh, I'm not saying it's right. What I am saying is that it, it is a damn shame that, you know, he had to speak, you know, we're saying that we had, he had to speak a different language to save his life. That, I think, is the problem in itself. But it, I think it is a fact that if he had spoken his language, the commonality would have rang true. Now, I, I really, I had a question. Because we're here, we're talking about Trayvon Martin, we're talking about the courts. And uh, it seems we've, we've had a lot of issues with the courts, and we've had some court decisions go our ways, but I think personally sometimes it's like you think, oh, yeah, well, if we change the courts and we do this and things are going to come to a head, and I'm starting to think that using the courts as kind of liaison to getting where we need to get is limited. And if that's limited, I want to know what I have to do or what anyone else has to do in order to kind of forward an agenda of, of, of love and equality amongst all people. All right, okay. All right, now we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have it around today, but let's get, all, let's get everybody in line, get their questions out, and then we'll, we'll get answers and responses. Yes, go right ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I just got something to say. One thing I wanna know for sure, where do we stand as young African male and female in the United States? 
where do we stand in terms of value? We can value ourselves higher than any white supremacy, but we're still less respected. Where do we stand? Money-wise, racial-wise, economically, social. All I want to know is, where do we stand? How far will we go? All right, okay, thank you much. Yes, sir. I'd like to thank y'all for coming and being here today to discuss this. And I just wanted to say that um, Martin Luther King said a long time ago that, <clears throat> excuse me, forgive me, injustice done anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that being said, we're talking about Trayvon, but in that same regard, uh, I humbly believe that it all comes down to economics. And uh, Speak up a little louder so people can hear you. Said I humbly believe that it all comes down to economics, the almighty dollar. And uh, to that regard, it doesn't matter black, white. Uh, and to that point, what I wanted to do was pay, play an excerpt from uh, CNBC uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, maybe some of you might remember last October there was a nanny that was accused of killing two children. And um, just, I think, two minutes of this, if you'll allow me to do that, would kind of give light to what I'm and talking about. And what's the nature of it now? Uh, it's in reference to um, the underlying circumstances as to what really happened with that nanny. And, um, well, go ahead. Let's let's let's, let's roll it because we we we're, we're, we want enough time to for wrap up. So. Jenkins, about a, um, CNBC executive's children. They were murdered. I, I don't, hear that. I don't, I don't okay. think we're going to be able to hear it. But we appreciate the give give us the essence of it real quick. What does what's the essence of what it was trying to say? Long story short, there was a gentleman, an executive with CNBC, that put a story up about a forty-three trillion dollar lawsuit. And again, I say $43 trillion lawsuit against the uh, banksters, as they're called. So if anybody wants to check that out, YouTube, $43 trillion banksters. And it'll go into the story and how it seems to be a clandestine operation, how that nanny was made to look like she murdered those children and then tried to okay. kill herself. All right. We're going to make the sister there the last one because we want to have chances for some response. And I certainly want to have a word before it's over as well. Go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I do want to thank everyone on the panel for your very informative presentations um, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Devine Pryor talked about the prison industrial complex or the pipeline in Southeast Queens, Bedford-Stuyve, there are numerous communities around New York City that we know are feeder sites to essentially what is that system here in uh, New York State. And I just want to give you just an example of something before I pose my question. I had a circumstance in which a uh, young man, a student, trying to become a security guard, was stopped on his way home trying to ride his bicycle, his only means of transportation to and from school. Unfortunately, he lost it with the officers who stopped him because he had been stopped two times prior to that and he was just tired of being stopped for riding his bicycle home, his transportation to and from school. They told him, we're just going to take you with us and give you a quality of life summons, but they in fact took him to central booking, and by the time he was released the next day, he had signed onto a misdemeanor that they had said that if you keep your nose clean for the next six months, it'll disappear. He had no idea what it was. He was concerned about getting to school, he couldn't be absent, and as a result of that, he now has a record a that record. will lead to something else. Right. So there are like thousands of young people that use bicycles as transportation because they can't afford to get on a bus or a train. It's their means to get around the community. In New York City now, we have Citigroup that has bicycles that you can just opt to get on and travel here and there. You could have gotten in a cab, a subway, you have money. It's a corporate thing there, but here to be able to ride a bicycle, whether you go up on the sidewalk, he was actually walking his bicycle, he wasn't even riding it, but the implications of that. I happen to have seen this mentioned though when I read an article that was discussing the Floyd case and somebody in Brooklyn talked about how we're being stopped for riding our bicycles. I think that's something that we need to look into because that starts that unfortunate journey to what could end up being that pipeline to some other uh, incarceration. 
My question is as, is as an adult, I often stop and watch when I see the police stop other people because I want to see what's going on. I'm in the street. I get stopped in my car. I question them why you're stopping me. This is not for a violation. They just pull you over and it's just like, it's just like a check. What right do I have to stand there and actually observe what should be my distance, what should be my stance. Um, I know that if I pull out my phone and try to take some video, I may get arrested. I mean, we've had people that were trying to protest for Sean Bell's murder, and at a vigil, they were arrested for protesting. What are our rights in terms of trying to uh, perform a civic duty to try to observe and then perhaps provide witness for people that are involved in stop and frisk and who potentially could be harmed we'll, in a very we'll, serious way? We'll try way. to get a quick answer to that question, but let me just lay this out quickly one of the things that you touched on that a lot of people are not familiar with. It doesn't matter whether you're eventually proven to be innocent. Very often when you go to get a job, the question is, have you ever been arrested? And the very fact that you've been arrested therefore puts you in a disadvantageous position. So that's why this can be so, uh, so hideous and uh, heinous. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Giselle Brown, I'm 19 years old. And my whole thing with the Trayvon Martin situation is Nobody actually looked at it from a young person's point of view. And me as a 19 year old, if somebody's following me, somebody's watching me, and I feel some type of way about it, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna ask you like, what's your deal, like what's your problem, right? And I feel like everyone is just, I'm not saying what Zimmerman did was right at all. I'm just saying like, Trayvon Martin is gone. And you only have one side of the story, really. And no one really knows what happened besides Trayvon and Zimmerman. So how can you really judge, you know? And um, another thing is, you guys ever heard the story of the how scorpion you, and but, the frog? But, 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 but how do you judge? How do I judge? What do you think happened? What's your, what's your opinion about what happened in that uh, confrontation? All right, my question to you is, if you were young, when you were young, right? I'm sorry, when you were young, and somebody was following you and you felt, you know, intimidated, what would you do? Just what you said. I mean, I, I agree. I would have done the same thing. Because the issue is, did Trayvon Martin have a right to stand his ground when he felt threatened by a stranger who was following him around? And I think he was frightened. I think he was Correct. scared. And, in the, and it doesn't matter to me what happened after that, because in fact, he may have in got, fact gotten into a confrontation and he might have, I can't say what I think might have happened. He might have dusted the dude. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might have, in fact, been getting the best of the, of the confrontation. Mm -hmm. But in that situation, the way the case was brought, Gloria, they, they kept hanging the case on who was on top and who was on the bottom. I don't care who's on top and who's on the bottom. Mm -hmm. If you followed me and I'm scared and we get into a throwdown and I get the best of it, that does not entitle you to pull out your gun and kill me. But then that goes with it. That goes with it. If, like you said, say Trayvon was beating him up. Say Trayvon was beating him up. I think he was beating him up. They say he played football. A 15-year-old playing football, you know how big his hands are. You know he's pretty. 17, 16, that's a pretty big kid. So I felt like no one's actually looking at it from Zimmerman's side. I'm not saying well, it's right the, at all. The jury did. And you're, right, you're right, you're right. All right, so let's get to the next one, please. Let's, and then we'll have some other responses to that. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Hill, and I'm, I'm speaking the microphone, please. My name is Kevin Hill, and I'm a veteran of this here, you know, York College. Um, my question deals with something very, very specific, and people touched upon it. Well, oh, my question deals with two things: readiness and courage. You can be ready, or are you courageous? What are you, what are you strategically thinking, right? What are you physically doing to make sure that you come out on top? And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, is that we need to think more strategically, move more creatively, and shine more vibrantly. And what do I mean by that? Making sure you understand the policies Right? And the attitudes and the people that it encases themselves in places of power. We got voting power. We got intellectual power. We got financial power. 
if you take your money out from these systems, right, automatic collapse. If you raise your voices and your fists, not swinging, but raising your fists, right, people will get to understanding where you're coming from. So it's all about courage. Are you courageous? Okay. And if you show you're courageous, right, then you thus have power. All right. A platform okay. for us to move together as a unit. And if there is any meeting space, any sort of meeting forum, any group that allows intergenerational connections, because the problem is not just white, black. I think it has to do with young and older people not being together, not understanding each other. So what do you guys offer as space, whether it's somewhere in York or somewhere public, that we can, as a group, move together and move forward? OK, thank you much. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to get some responses from the panel. I'm going to make, because we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to just do my quickie right now in terms of a perspective, and then we'll, we can, we'll loop back around. And that is because it seems to me that this issue of courage that was raised by our York student is incredibly important because it seems to me we've got to keep our eyes on the prize. One of the things that did not come out in this discussion is the way in which these stand your ground laws actually develop. All across your map, quietly, some white billionaires called the Koch brothers have been, have been funding something called the American Legislative Exchange Committee, American, uh, ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Committees, councils, I'm sorry, to develop these stand your ground laws. And the question you have to ask yourself, given what Professor Nampia said and, and, and others, stand your ground against who? And I think if you do a careful, not even cursory review of the history, it is because of this specter of the dangerous black man. And that's real. And it doesn't matter whether you're in a suit and a tie, whether you got a double-breasted, no matter how clean you may be, if you're black in America, brown in America, you're a suspect. The Attorney General of the United States was talking about having to sit his son down as a middle class, upper class Attorney General of the United States because we are not valued. We're not valued. And no amount of changing our appearance, our language, like people say, well look, if you just pulled your pants up, they, they wouldn't treat you that way. If you didn't wear a hoodie, that was one of the things, that, don't wear a hoodie. You are entitled to wear a hoodie. You should not be criminalized because you wear a hoodie or you should not be criminalized because you're sagging. I may have a different preference, but that's irrelevant. And so one of the things that I'm proposing, and then with a different hat, Institute of the Black World 21st Century, you know, we are pushing a boycott of Florida. We're saying that nobody should go to Florida for, you know, Minnie and Mickey should play with themselves for a while. There should be no, stop drinking Florida orange juice. Don't go to any conventions there. Cancel your vacations there. It is said that black people spend over $1 billion alone in Fort Lauderdale. If you shut off the economic pipeline, then they will change the stand your ground law, which was used as a pretext by Zimmerman to kill Trayvon Martin. So there are two things that we can do. We need to march on ballot boxes. You need to register and vote. We need to march on ballot boxes in Florida. But I'm not sure we have enough power at the ballot box to do this. But what we do know historically from Martin Luther King with the Montgomery bus boycott to other boycotts that have, been, that have taken place. If you shut up South Carolina and the Confederate flag is one example, where eventually because they shut off the tourism, they changed the location. Arizona did not endorse the Martin Luther King bill for many, many years until they shut off the tourism to the tune of $300 million, and all of a sudden, they changed their minds. So moral appeal is one thing. Dressing up, painting up, getting your degree may be one thing. But if you shut off the economic front, that is what will work. Now, there's a group of, and you saw them, and we'll play it, we play it at the end, courageous students who are in Florida. They're called the Dream Defenders. This one brother, whose name is um, Agnew, they say he may be the next Martin Luther King. They say he's seriously bad. He says he's ready. So we can connect you with them. 
because they are determined inside Florida as students. They're risking their lives at their education as college students standing up, saying they want to change the stand your ground law. So we can have all the other conversations we want about how we internally need to do better. I certainly support that. But we need to focus on the issue, I think, of economic sanctions and boycott Florida. And for those of you who want a t-shirt to that effect, you can come and get one at a reasonable cost after the event. Now, let's, um, about a minute each, because frankly, and you can take whatever aspect of what you heard possible, because we really are approaching class time. Let's start on this side uh, with Professor Nampi and work our way this way. And each of you have to be really about 45 seconds succinct response, what you've heard and how do we move forward. Thank you for all the questions and the comments, and, and again to Brother Daniels for bringing us together like this. I don't know how you do it, but you do do it. Um, I can speak to Brother Ruiz's uh, question very quickly in 30 seconds. Uh, he was asking about the limitations of the courts for achieving justice and dignity. And it's a fair question, because I think if you look at the history of the legal system in the United States, the courts have not been our answer in the end. We have, however, used the courts when we could. And I will just say that there was a, a big argument that you all should look up between people like Thurgood Marshall and the folks at the NAACP legal, uh, legal defense t teams and areas, um, and the people like A. Philip Randolph and Dr. King, uh, the people who were in the streets and in the South agitating um, uh, in a, uh, uh, using civil disobedience, breaking the law um, in order to, uh, to struggle for justice. It's an interesting argument that you all should just be aware of and uh, incorporate into your uh, explorations into these things. Uh, Xavier. I'm Bring the microphone to you, please, sorry. Yes, I'm pretty sure some people have heard of the case of Jonathan Farrell. He was the young man who crashed his car in North Carolina the police present, they thought he was a threat, he was shot and killed. So in regards to how widespread the issue of racial profiling is in America, that is an example of the fact that it's pretty widespread. And it just goes back to the idea that if you are black, no matter what your overall appearance is, like you were saying, you are automatically deemed a threat to society. And I think that speaks more to a mentality problem that society has. So we need to just remove all bias, all tinted lens that everybody views in society, and the next time a case like Trayvon Martin happens, because unfortunately this will happen again, we can acquire all the facts, make a sound opinion as to what happened, come with a solution, and move forward as a society. Thank you. Ronald. So I'm going to stick to love, guys, because they got the economics part. and um. One thing I want to say is um, everyone says, well, yeah, I could have been Trayvon or my son could have been Trayvon. But when I was 15, I really could have been Trayvon. I found myself in the backyard of a uh, police. I didn't know he was a police officer, but he was having a party in his backyard and I happened to be there. Black man walks up to me and says, what the F you doing here? I says, hey, I'm just having a good time. He goes, well, who the F you know here? I go, nobody. I'm just here to have a good time. He goes, well, get the F out. I said, okay, no problem. I turned around to leave and he smacks me in the back of my head. I turned around, punched the man in the face. We ensued into a fight. He hit me to the ground. I picked up a bottle and smashed him in the head with it. I caught this case when I was 15 years old and I fought for my freedom and my life until I was 19 years old. Went to a three year trial. And the reason I'm bringing this story up is because this was a black man. This wasn't a white man or Hispanic man, but he was black. And he approached me with so much anger, with so much disdain, with so much hate. And so my question is, how can we expect white people to not treat us like that if we can't treat ourselves with more respect? And so that's why I feel like it starts with us. It's about love. And while we boycott Florida's products, let's make sure we change the life of one black man a year. And just start there. And you'll increase you know, the effect that your actions have. OK, Mark. <laughs> Those of you who are students and young people, it is very important to decide now to get involved in some organization or some movement working for the liberation of our people. 
no one can afford to just be a spectator. We have to commit ourselves like we used to, to being involved in something, some activity, some action, organizing and dealing with the fits and starts and the push and pull of working together in a collective for our ongoing liberation struggle. Dr. King was in his 20s when he was called to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. Malcolm X was in his 20s when he came out of prison and was tapped by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, to lead the mosque in Detroit. Uh, we know what happened. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating, Coordinating Committee in the South, was the backbone of the civil rights movement. So up. it is this generation, it is you as young people, and those of us who are still young at heart and young in spirit who are necessary to get involved. So join an organization, join a movement, and get involved. That's my recommendation. Divine. Uh, so very quickly, the best I can do is refer you to our website uh, because there's a lot that we do. Uh, my name is Dr. Divine Pry. I'm the executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions. We are the world's first and the world's only research, public policy, advocacy, and training center created, developed, designed, and run by formerly incarcerated professionals representing every discipline from law to medicine. If you want to get involved in some work, we got some work for you. The, e, the um, website is centerfornewleadership.org. Again, centerfornewleadership.org. And I'm sure you'll find plenty that you can get involved with if you're interested. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for staying at the time, too. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad you're here. I want you to write down these three things. One of them is social media. One of the things that allowed us to know what happened in Florida with Trayvon Martin was the fact that it was on social media. Instead of just sending something around, you can do that in addition to it. You need to make sure that you tap into social media to let other people know what the issues are that are going around so we can connect that way. If you have something, a major issue of concern, you need to be able to tap into social media to let us know about it, and then we can let you know about it. The other concern I have is this is called a hate crime. When a crime happens and you believe it's because of your race, it's, because, it's called a hate crime. You should report that to the police. The more hate crimes reported to police, the more they have to pay attention to different groups within this city. So you have the right to report the hate crimes, and when something happens to you, we dismiss so many things. Don't just dismiss it, report it to the police so that we have the statistics, and if you are stopped by the police under, and Darius will tell you more about it, you have the right to ask this police officer's name and information and make sure that a report is taken so that the numbers do reflect the true um, depth of stop and frisk in this country. The last is volunteer. You can volunteer at the Center for Constitutional Rights. You can volunteer for other organizations. You can volunteer to be the weekend warrior in your family. The weekend warrior. You don't have to give up school. What you do is make sure that you add to it the ability to make sure that your little brother, sister, cousins, neighbors are going to school. Go take them to the library. Take them to the Natural Let's History Museum. Yes. What you need to do is to be that advocate for your family. And as you become the advocate and activist for your family, that will extend to the community, and you will then see your place in the overall march toward racial justice. All right. Uh, Darius, there was a question specifically posed by whether you could record and all that. So in your conclusion, would you address that, please? So I was, I was going to address that. And the answer is you can. Um, the, the caveats are you, you obviously have to stand far enough away so that you are not interfering with the police officer's uh, work. Um, because if you stand too close, as clients of mine have experienced, you can get arrested yourself and they charge you what they call it, I think, obstruction of governmental uh, administration. So you can, but of course I think as the questioner pointed out very astutely, there's what the law says you can do, and then there's what the police do to you when you try to do something that is, in fact, legal. So you always, I think, have to be watch very careful. There are many organizations we work with that do what we call cop watch work, and they do it very well. They'll train you on how to do it. If you want to find out about it, um, again, you can visit our website. And 
Also, another really good resource for those of you interested in getting involved in the stop and frisk reform stuff is Communities United for Police Reform. It's a citywide coalition that I think has more than 60 organizations that do work all around the city in different neighborhoods. They have a great website called changethenypd.org, and they actually have very good information about Cop Watch stuff. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Let's give the panel a big round of applause. Big round of applause taking their time out. I want to also thank my colleagues from the Department of Behavioral Sciences who uh, came. We appreciate that. A big round of applause for the Educational Opportunity Center that always supports us. Give them a big round of applause. And uh, I also think that we should, Jonathan and others, we should have a forum in which we discuss this internal issue of our black value, violence internally and whatever, because the one thing I would say in concluding, the, these things are not either or. It's not that you either have to improve the internal value or resist external oppression. We have to do both, and we can do both. Uh, and, and we do need to do both because there is a lot of focus on what's going on inside our communities. But we really need to have a forum on that as well. If at all possible, if somebody's around, uh, we'd like to maybe in conclusion show that video so maybe people who didn't see it uh, we'll get a chance to also take a look at that as, uh, as well. Uh, finally, also, I wanted to talk about our trip to Selma this coming year, but I guess that'll be for another forum. Let's give our panel another big round of applause. If you have questions for them, you can come and do that as well. Thank you so much for coming out and participating this afternoon. <laughs>